let's just simply have the scenario of a buck is bedded in the afternoon. And when it gets on its feet and does that longer movement bout to go for the afternoon or evening meal, and let's look at once he's on his feet and starts moving, what is the prevailing wind? So that is something that we can control enough variables to see, um, is he going always or 90% of the time with his nose in the wind? Is it going to be a flanking where he's going to be perpendicular to the wind? Or is it completely random? So that is something where we know the direction the buck took and we know the direction of the wind. And then we can repeat that over and over and over again and come up with a number that X percent of the time with, against, perpendicular, etc. So that that's what we're working on. I know y'all haven't, I think before we started, Okay. you mentioned that you haven't, like concluded anything from that yet but you do have like a more often than not and then i cut you off because i'm like save it for the podcast yeah yeah well what was that what was that point what and if you remember before you so rudely cut me off (laughs) (laughs) i posed the question to you (laughs) so the question was when that bucks gets up out of his bed and he's going to go north south east west for a feeding bout Mm -hmm. do you think the wind is in his face which i think would be hunting conventional wisdom the wind is in his face or would the wind be in his back so he's moving with the wind not against it or perpendicular in other words is he moving north and the wind is coming west man i'm gonna say perpendicular what are you saying yeah i'm going perpendicular that that's about 50 50 of the people i've asked over the the past couple months about and and i was one of the ones like oh he's obviously he's going to have his nose in the wind he's going to be working against it so he's going to be getting information from the area he is moving into and about half the people were like no 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 he's going to be moving perpendicular what we have seen so far, and I reserve the right, <laughs> so listen to me now. <laughs> I reserve the right that if a month or two months or whenever we feel like we have completely been through this, if, if it's wrong or different or is different, I'm going to come back and tell you this was the final answer. The preliminary answer is they are either very clearly or the clearest signal we see is they are either, and it's about 50-50, they're either moving with it or against it, but not perpendicular. What? Interesting. Whoa. Hmm. No wonder I've never seen any bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> huh. Dude, yeah. Okay. I didn't expect that. I, I've heard we have, we have, we've talked to one uh, one guy. Our, uh, yeah, I know exactly and where you're going. He he says he's witnessed a lot of deer when going to a destination food source in the evenings. Liking a tailwind, personally, that's what he's seen. Um, you know, wind coming from their back. And his thought was specifically on larger destination food sources, specifically larger food plots, is his thought process is he's walking into something that he can potentially see, you know, depending on how the cover is, he can see in front of him, but he can smell everything behind him uh, from potentially getting ambushed by something. Um, and he's just kind of document himself doesn't have any kind of data on it but he's like i've noticed that specifically when hunting around larger destination food plot feeding areas um so that that is because i was actually thinking when i said perpendicular i was actually going to say tailwind because i was like i was just thinking about what he's told me in the past i'm like maybe maybe there's something to it which mm-hmm. seems like there's something to it uh on that aspect or with a headwind but one thing i always bring it with the wind and now in some of your study areas is fairly flat I don't know how much you deal with like swirling wind conditions and also getting accurate wind readings in the field versus, you know, how close you are to an airport or where there's actually, you know, yeah. a reading station at. And now there's more and more, I've heard there's some more research going on of different companies actually looking to make smaller um, weather stations you could put in the field, wind stations, stuff like that, in order to get detailed wind readings specifically in test sites, which would be super interesting to use. I don't know if y'all are using anything like that currently, but um, is the swirling wind situation when we're in hill country and especially before the leaves fall off the trees with these higher canopies of these hardwoods, it seems like when this wind comes over the, the these ridges, there's always these pockets of swirling air. And I always feel like deer use them, especially bucks use them as a way to scent like a larger landscape, but also it's super hard to 
hunt, but also super hard to know if you're looking at the map, like, is he walking through an area potentially that there's more swirling winds versus an area that's a little more flat, maybe it's a little more gentle uh, rolling terrain, yeah. and the wind's a little bit more consistent there. Yeah, that, that that's excellent thought there. So the way we have to control that is, uh, well, first of all, if we were going to set this up, if the purpose of this study way back was that we would have our own weather stations all over that so we would know exactly. But that wasn't the purpose of the study way back when. So what we are uh, getting is the closest weather station, you know, like uh, a government weather station. Um which was less than 60 miles away, uh, maybe more like 40 miles away. So what we have to do is when you have the light and variable wind, we just don't look at the data for that day. So we exclude scenarios where it's going to be messy to interpret and only look at those days of we've got a definitive wind out of the north and it's 10 to 12 miles an hour. And so we just look at those examples and try to come up with a trend, you know, based on that. And then with the power of large numbers, so you've got two years of data. So you've got a lot of different reps, replications there. And then you've got 50 to 60 individuals. So you're going to get a lot of trials to where you can test this. And we should end up with thousands and thousands of scenarios where we had a solid and definitive wind and then we had those individual movements and then we'll make our calculations based on that. Yeah, and also the swirling wind question, if they're navigating across the landscape and he's covering ground, I guess you could kind of look at that as he is trying to keep the wind in his face because even like especially in a flat land like you're gonna hit areas where that wind is swirling like especially where there's like a difference in the uh heights of the trees or there's like that riverbed or something when that wind comes over it it's gonna curl and kick back and do weird stuff but you're also gonna go through a lot of pockets where it is a north wind or a south wind or whatever the dominant wind is for that day right yeah great example talk about the swirling winds and also talking about thermals is we've done that smoke bomb test. We haven't videoed it and put it on YouTube yet, but oh, we did it on the club. Don't give away our idea. We had some well, interesting results. I'm writing this down. So, <laughs> so, no, it, we had some interesting results of actually seeing how thermals and very light winds affected using smoke bombs in open areas that met up against different tree lines and how you could see the, the smoke swirling in very specific corners. Like, it's very interesting. Again, on the uh, the example you had of that buck, um, that three-and-a-half-year-old we looked at earlier, where you had corners of like a field or something like that, and, you, and that, that wind's blowing down into it, you light that smoke bomb up, and you can see it eddy and kick back in a circle right there in that corner where all that wind's funneling down to. Mm -hmm. And it's super interesting because – at least in the past, and like in this example, we were in a clear cut with uh, two SMZs. One came through the middle of the clear cut. One was a bigger creek drainage parallel in the clear cut. That wind would swirl down in the bottom, and that's like the area that typically we'd find like a big scraper, community scrape is right there in that specific spot. Yeah, it's like where, a thermal hub. Where Yeah, where all this all this sense pulling down into, but it's kicking around. It's like a buck could – he doesn't have to walk right through it. He could walk within 100 yards of it and catch that scent without actually having to go to that specific yeah. site, which is super interesting. Yeah, and in that SMZ that we were sitting on too, that smoke bomb went for like – you know, two minutes or whatever. Like I got, I got some serious smoke bombs off the internet to do this with. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was putting out some stuff and I was like, hopefully there's no planes flying around that like, are <laughs> like freaked out by this. And in that SMZ, that smoke was gone out of there. And, and assuming that's like your scent or whatever, like that smoke was gone out of there in like, I don't know, three or four minutes. And it got down to that thermal hub, and it just hung down there. I mean, it all went to that spot and stayed for like a long time. It was also right at daylight, or you know, right at first light. You know, still like a falling thermal, high humidity, dew point still. You know, dew still set, so everything's like settling down in there. And it was very interesting to see how everything pulled up, and it started just kicking around down in there for a little while. So, anyways. I'm not saying some way you could apply that, but it's fascinating to kind of see that, and also seeing how the deer sign relates. No doubt. To that. So, so, do you is that based on topography 
or the intersection of topography and vegetation? But yeah, I think it's one. both. The second one, yeah. Topography and vegetation, because this is an area, not big hill country, but elevation change, maybe 60 feet or something like that, gradually. And just everything wanted to go down the SMZ, lift the smoke bomb above the SMZ, it just sucked down in there and got in that corner and just started to want to kick around and just linger right in that specific spot. Yeah, and it kind of seemed, it almost seemed like it hit the timber and kind of rode the edge of the timber a little bit. I'm sure it seeped in, but we couldn't really see that well. But it definitely wasn't coming out the other side of the timber. It was like, it was kind of riding that edge. And the SMZ is probably, the timber's probably 20 yards wide maybe on it? Yeah, it probably starts at like 20 yards wide. And as you go down, it gets a lot wider than yeah. that. So, but yeah, that was that was pretty. Can, can you see one of those areas from a map? Aerial, absolutely. Though? You can pick those out on the landscape. Absolutely, oh, that yeah. could be something we could test. Well, and that's something that when we go and hunt spots like that, I'm always, I love those areas where you have all these intersecting SMZs around a clear cut. But also, I hate those areas. Like I love them for deer move, but I hate them because your wind always swirls in those spots. Like it just, it always seems like it lingers. Like it's what people would call like a bowl. Like you have all these drainages coming down to one spot. And like a lot of people kill a lot of big deer there, but also they're really tricky to hunt because of the wind swirling. And it kind of goes back to, I always grew up with my uncles hunting with them and they are always very cautious about hunting with the wind. But I knew other guys, like when I used to live in Arkansas, they didn't care about the wind. They'd go hit, hunt their stands. They hunted those stands for 25 years. And at some point they're going to kill a buck in that spot. Just when the conditions allowed it and just however everything set up and the time was right, they killed a really nice buck in those areas. Uh, but yeah, you can see them on the map. And that's something we try to focus on, especially for putting trail cameras out. Mm -hmm. It's like you always seem to get bucks popping down into that spot. And typically you'll find a big scrape there or it's an awesome spot to put in a mock scrape. 